got big beer. Hello, beer. Laura. Oh, there she is. Good morning. Who is who is not okay. muting his microphone? Uh, nobody right now. So uh, you're on. You're online now. So one is missing, yeah? Yeah, it will appear. Mm. Do you know who to call? Mm -hmm. You know who to call them to 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 be on. Um, some some people wanted to see the event, but uh, they were wondering if they would hook directly via Zoom or if they could only watch it via YouTube. Okay. So I'm letting them know that they can only watch it via YouTube. Klaus, må vi ikke lige låne den nye? Yeah. We, we are waiting. Uh, Klaus just found a gold gobba, so he just wants to show you. Is that okay? He, he's here. So have a have a look. Hello. 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 Nice to see you. Morning. Are we okay? Oh. Yeah, we are okay. Yeah, yeah that's good. Let them see it, and then you can okay. tell tell what you did. Yeah. Can you see that? Uh, uh, yeah, can you see that little gold figure? Yeah. Oh, no, not yet. Not yet. Closer to the camera, please. <laughs> there you go. Uh, it's a big one. It's a big yeah, one. Yeah, it's rather big. Yeah. It's found uh, of, of the, as a close to Sor de Mul. Ah. But, not, but not on the temple place. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's another place. Yeah. It's a spring. Yeah. It's very, uh, it's very funny to find these things. <laughs> How far <laughs> away from the, from the cult house? I think almost 100 meters. 100 meters. Okay, so it's within the uh, the area where you yeah, have to set yeah. it. Yeah, we have water, water there. The wow. water. Yeah. So it's like the gold hole, Carolina. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Lovely. Thanks Have for sharing. Lovely. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, guys, you are now uh, live on uh, YouTube. <clears throat> Thank you. And uh, I would recommend you to uh, mute your microphone in order not to uh, get echo. If you don't do it, I will do it. Um, so, um, uh, yeah, so I've uh, muted you. I hope also Matt. Matthew. Matthew. Is is frozen. Hello. Okay. Hello. Yeah. Hello. And uh, what about? Uh, I have a little problem with connection. Matthew, please mute your. Yeah. Okay. Please mu mute your. F Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, then, um, yeah, hello again, Laura, and um, uh, heartily welcome to our uh, first uh, webinar uh, in the Archaeobal project. I mean, um, in these, uh, in these uh, a bit weird uh, circumstances, um, we have chosen to uh, go online um, and uh, our uh, special guest today, uh, Matthew Nelson and Laura, something I can't pronounce uh, properly, but uh, Ligatzolo, I hope Perfect. it's right, um, has uh, agreed to uh, share this um, event with us. And um, 
my uh, my job is to um, uh, to uh, yeah to manage the technical uh, side and also to um, to uh, manage uh, the comments um, which might come uh, online on our live stream uh, YouTube. Um, the live stream YouTube is um, running right now and. Uh, uh, the audience has the possibility of uh, of uh, asking questions or uh, commenting on it uh, via the uh, YouTube chat. So um, if you go into the Archeobalt uh, YouTube um, channel, you will uh, be able to uh, to see uh, how many uh, are attending, and you are also uh, able to uh, comment uh, and uh, ask questions to the uh, to the speakers now um, the agenda today uh, is um, is um, in, in in two main parts one is uh, from scheduled here from uh, 10 to uh, 12 uh, about 12 o'clock uh, then we will have uh, a break uh, and uh, then we have uh, a second section um which then is uh, planned to uh, end approx at uh, 1400 hours so after that we will have a uh, an open uh, discussion and question session uh, and and we will end uh, this uh, event at approx uh, half past 2 now the uh, the agenda for today is um is uh, in my view a very uh, central ad agenda, uh, also uh, on the background of uh, the current uh, events with the Corona crisis. I mean, we will. Uh, I mean, that's not um, my idea. It's from the uh, the touristic board of uh, of of Bornholm, who already said that this uh, Corona crisis will increase local and regional tourism so um so um people will be uh, more uh, focused on uh, let's say uh, small distance uh, small distance traveling than to uh, to um, continue with uh, long distance uh, air traffic and um so um due to this uh circumstance i mean the possibility of promoting our project the archaeobalt project uh, is uh, even more important so i will uh, hardly welcome all of you uh, to this event and i will shortly pre present the agenda for today so we will start with our uh, leader of the project carolina zonska from the university of of gdansk who will um tell us about uh, the Archeobelt uh, project in a uh, archaeo tourism perspective. Then uh, Professor Mats uh, Roslund from Lund University will uh, focus on the uh, world famous site of Uboka and how uh, the Uboka project um, has uh, that's combined uh, a different uh, pers perspective of uh, the archaeological heritage. So uh, then we will uh, have the pleasure of uh, presenting uh, the uh, chief archaeologist of uh, of the wonderful island of Bornholm, Finn Ole Sonne Nielsen, who will tell uh, about the uh, tell us about the excavations at Sordemul, and then. Um, we will return to Carolina and Bart. Uh, yeah, I don't know uh, how to pronounce it, Bartosz or something. Uh, uh, and they will focus on uh, their diggings at uh, Ovice. Now then we will have the break. And Andrzej uh, Gierski from the uh, Museum of Gdansk will tell us about uh, the uh, famous uh, events uh, of um, archaeo tourism at the uh, at a fortress uh, nearby Gdansk. 
following by uh, our first uh, guest uh, speaker, uh, Mats Nelson from Linnaeus University uh, in uh, Kalmar. He will focus, uh, he has a PhD pro project focusing on uh, a topic which is very, very central for, uh, for this uh, project as such. So we look uh, very much forward to welcome uh, Mats here in our panel. Then uh, finally, um, we will have a uh, fantastic uh, uh, presentation by Laura Ligazzolo, um, who is um, uh, who has been involved in a um, let's say similar project uh, rooted uh, also um, uh, in in the uh, in the uh, EU program, and uh, who will tell us about uh, the concept of uh, of uh, combining uh, different uh, sites in a uh, cultural route. So. Uh, with this, um, I will um, unshare my screen and I will uh, give the word to uh, Carolina Sonske. Good morning. Uh, I'm very happy that um, we have we start with this uh, Archibald webinar. Mm, and during my presentation, I will more focus on uh, Archaeobalt project, its archaeotouristic uh, uh, potential, and it will be kind of introduction to the lectures which will appear during this uh, webinar. So I will share my presentation. <clears throat> uh, during my presentation, um, I will, as I said, I will focus on uh, archaeo touristic potential of Archaeobalt project, and I would like to make you a little bit more familiar with the idea uh, of the project and with the main goals, uh, outputs, and um, effects. <clears throat> Excuse me, some technical issue. Um, Archaeobalt uh, project is three years uh, project, which is which is confinanced by European uh, De European Development Fund with an Interreg Baltic program 2014-2020. It is cooperation between the universities and the museums. We have five uh, partners. It's University of Gdańsk. Museum of Gdańsk, Borchans Museum, uh, Aarhus University, and Lund University. During um, the last few years, we had a big pleasure as a University of Gdańsk to cooperate with Borchans Museum, and uh, we start the whole concept uh, of the uh, project concept a few years uh, ago, and it was related with our experiences uh, um, which we have during the which we had during the excavations on both home but also uh, in Poland and it was perfect uh, moment to um, ask for support and start the cooperation with other institutions in the South Baltic Sea region and that's why we have this big pleasure to to cooperate uh, with the institutions which I mentioned at the moment. <clears throat> Um, the, when we are talking about uh, archaeotourism, um, we have to have, we also have to think about the society and the touristic groups and um, group of interests uh, who are working, who are living in this area. For the majority of society, when we uh, when the word archaeology is used, we think of uh, exotic excavations. We are thinking about. Egypt, for example, ancient Greece, Rome. 
a comparison to ancient monument, the archaeological heritage in the Baltic Sea region may uh, see modest and small scale. In the social conscious, uh, cult uh, cultural heritage is namely, uh, mainly associated with monumental architecture, like castles, like churches, uh, but uh, many of them are well known. However, around us, many archaeological places functioned only in the minds of um, professionalists and uh, curious tourists. Archaeological heritage is fascinating and is giving many opportunity to spend actively free time, especially now when the global tourist trends move towards uh, the idea of three E, entertainment, excitement, education, uh, and also well-being and slow uh, tourism. Archaeotourism is a perfect uh, alternative, especially in this very unique situation which we have right now with uh, coronavirus pandemia. The question is about the proper balance between the protection of archaeological heritage and uh, expectation of the tourist threat. In the Baltic Sea region, the touristic potential of archaeological heritage is not fully used. It is often uh, it is often the result of educational process that does not include knowledge of prehistorical past. And in this case, we have different experiences uh, between our countries and institutions uh, which are involved uh, to the uh, project. Our previous um, experiences, especially related with excavations on Bornholm, but uh, also uh, in Poland at Ovid, uh, has shown uh, that the demand of knowledge about the archaeological pa uh, past is high. During the excavations, we saw a uh, big interest of the local community and tourists in our work and discover uh, artifacts. On the photos, you may see the open days, which were organized during excavations at um, Norisonegard Cemetery in 2014 and 2016. And these open days uh, took place the last day of um, excavations. And we have to say that we all were uh, slightly surprised because of the number of visitors. We, have, we, had, we had several hundred people who come and uh, who came and, uh, and want to see and participate uh, in this um, open days. And these events show that um, scale of interest uh, in the topic is really big. That is why we decided to start work on project aimed at popularization the Baltic Sea heritage and at the same time promoting a new branch of tourists related with archaeology, related to archaeology. Besides, uh, we decide that this topic shouldn't, should be developed, developed not only on, uh, uh, at the reg regional level, but also at cross-border level. That's why we started the cooperation with Denmark, Sweden, and uh, Poland. Uh, we want to contribute the knowledge and, uh, excuse, excuse me, we want to combine the knowledge and uh, different experiences, um, our institutions. Um, the project is co-created by universities whose main uh, goal is research and educational aspects and museums which focus mainly on promoting heritage, but not only. The project, <clears throat> the project aims, uh, the, the project aim aims to uh, uncover the new way of promoting our joint cultural heritage through many activities, which will boost the touristic uh, exchange in South Baltic Sea region by creating a new brand, sustainable green and blue archaeotourism. The main goals <clears throat> of the project are both to uh, uh, elaborate the final protocol, strategy, and tools for archaeotourism in South Baltic Sea region and develop 
the sustainable green and blue tourist uh, green and blue touristic archaeo route in uh, South Baltic Sea a region. And our proposition is um, archaeo route. Archibald Archeorut, which we called Place of Power and Rituals, which links five very unique archaeological sites uh, in the region and on this place are organized events, but also we communicate um, with the public and working with uh, promotion and popularization via uh, internet. And um, I would like to uh, introduce the places which were chosen uh, to this uh, project. However, um, I will just mention them because uh, they will be presented also during our uh, webinar in particular uh, lectures. First of them is Lund um, uh, and uh, Upokra, uh, which is located in the Southern Sweden in uh, Scania region near, uh, near Lund. It's one of the essential religious and uh, political uh, centers, which I would say gave a birth to the Christian Lund. And during our presentation, uh, during our webinar, Professor Mats Roslund will make us more familiar with this beautiful uh, place and uh, will also share their experience related uh, with archaeotourism and uh, public uh, archaeology. And next, second place is Sortemult, uh, which on which took place excavations last uh, year. And in this um, activities participate Borhans Museum, uh, Aarhus University and University of Gdańsk. Uh, the largest Pogan temple in Baltic Sea region was discovered at Sortemult complex on Borholm and over 2,600 votive folias uh, called gold guber, which means gold man, uh, were found uh, in this uh, area. Um, this place will be presented by Finula uh, Sonne Nielsen from Borholm's Museum, and um, <clears throat> he will tell us more about uh, the experiences related uh, with uh, this unique uh, places and what was the um, reaction of people who were coming and visiting uh, this place. Third place is Morinje. It's uh, also a place associated with the Pogan worship in the center part of the Borholm on Borholm of Borholm near Okjokedi. The water spring, uh, long rows of heads uh, were discovered there. And near this place were found a gold figure present, presented an old woman, which is called Mamuna, and a folias uh, this, uh, depicting the tools. It's the third place uh, uh, which we have in our uh, Archeobald, uh, Archeorud, place of power and ritual. So, in the southern part of the Baltic uh, Sea, uh, were, uh, two exciting places have been uh, selected. They are associated with uh, more with the Middle Ages and uh, with uh, modern, especially more with the modern uh, modern times. First uh, is uh, of its stronghold. Um, the stronghold of Ovis is one of the largest early medieval stronghold in uh, Pomerania region. It is located on the essential thread road, which is called Via Mercatorum, leading from the Baltic Sea to the Great Poland. And this is the place which uh, function in between 10th and 12th century. And during my uh, second uh, presentation, uh, I will tell more about this place and I would like to make you more familiar with our experiences related with archaeotourism and, um, and the results of archaeological uh, research. Uh, the last but not least um, place is Wisłoujście Fortes, Never concrete gate of Poland, Gdańsk, and uh, Poland. Uh, it is uh, one of the most essential, um, never concrete, let's say, historical modern 
uh, forces in the Baltic Sea region. And I would say a pair among Dansk, uh, Dansk's fortification. And at the same time, it is symbolic gate to, to the city and uh, to Poland. In this part, uh, this part will be presented by Andrzej Gierszewski from Gdańsk uh, Museum, and we will focus, uh, he will make us more familiar with this unique place. The way of our work, how we work in Archaeobalt uh, project, and what, who are the main um, target groups. The project is addressed to visitors, tourists, inhabitants, such uh, inhabitants such as families, uh, seniors, students, school groups, etc., but also to social and touristic organizations, NGOs, cultural education institutions, and other actors who are interested in South Baltic uh, archaeotourism. Uh, we are working on a uh, few levels. First, which is taking place during the excavations and during the season, we organize it in various forms, open days um, in uh, all of these places. It is possible for the tourists to um, see the archaeological uh, profession, be a part of uh, archaeological process. We are showing them uh, the whole process from the beginning, from the moment when we discovered the place, to the moment when we uh, start with the uh, uh, with the storage and work with uh, artifacts. In this area, we have uh, in the project also different um, different uh, experiences, which I think will be very uh, very interesting to uh, to present. And next option are workshops, workshops uh, which are dedicated to different uh, target groups. Mm, they took place. At Wisła uh, Uszcze, um, Ovid, and in uh, Uprakra, the small gentleman which we can see uh, on one of the uh, photos. Um, in these places, we have different target groups, so we use different forms of uh, communication and uh, interaction. Uh, during my second presentation, I will tell a little bit more uh, about um, our experiences from. Uh, from Ovid. Third way, festivals. Festivals which are organized uh, as a part of Archaeobalt project. We had in 2019 um, festival at Wisła Uście and we were part uh, of a um, festival at uh, Upokra related with Vandal Days. Uh, this year, because of the situation in which we have Award situation in which we have, it will be uh, more problematic to organize the, the, the festivals. However, we have to wait for the final decision, um, especially uh, in, in, in Sweden. And next form are the festivals in which we participate. Um, this year, uh, we had the pleasure to present Archibald and Archibald uh, project results at uh, fam Travel Family Festival, which is called Falkuna Matata Nidinia. We wanted to present also uh, the project at Free Time Festival, which is the biggest uh, touristic festival um, in, on, in Pomerania. But it was in April and it was canceled because of the uh, pandemia. So part of the events is postponed to 2021. Archaeobalt and archaeotouristic uh, potential. So archaeobalt in some numbers. During the open days in 2019, we had nearly 6,000 guests at Sortemov, Upokra, of its Tronco, Visoshi Fortress, and Smoringa. So I would say that is a quite big amount of, um, of tourists and people who are interested uh, in this form of um, uh, activity. Festivals. Uh, festivals visit almost 10,500 uh, people uh, at Upokra and uh, Wisłowiście. And uh, the all events uh, were in all events uh, participated nearly 17,000 people. 
during our open days workshop, guided tours during the excavations festivals and open lectures, which are also a part of our project. So interaction with the tourist, uh, with the tourists is a very important part of the, uh, of the project. We have possibility to present our result with more living history. However, um, you may see in the, you may see in the, the numbers that the, this uh, form of activity is very um, become more and more uh, popular, and people are looking for new form uh, of uh, activities. And I agree here with uh, Jens opinion that probably during this year we'll have to also to change a little bit thinking uh, about the way of um, spending free time and this big chance for our uh, project. We are not only focused on activity uh, related uh, with the excavations, but also um, um, we are focused not only on real life, but also on virtual world. Um, in the project, one of the part one of the part project is pylon uh, investment uh, related with uh, related to um, VR games and board games. And I think that um, some suggestions and comments to this uh, uh, part will also uh, will also have uh, Andrzej, uh, and he will tell us a little bit more during his presentations. And uh, I hope that also Mats will uh, share. Uh, his experiences um, in guiding himself <laughs> during the um, during the the, the, the voyage on beautiful uh, Upoka. Uh, virtual act uh, virtual activities uh, will be very important during this year. Um, what is of course related with the pandemic situation. That's why uh, we start working with um, website. Uh, Virtual Museum of Soul Baltic region, which is uh, in preparation, and it will be a repository of information about archaeotouristic uh, attraction uh, in, in the region. But on this website, we don't want to focus only on uh, archaeology because um, the main target group will be, from one on one hand, um, tourists, but on the other hand, tourist organizations, um, institutions. Uh, guides, it will be the place where people can find uh, proper information about archaeology and uh, uh, Baltic Sea uh, uh, archaeotouristic uh, attractions. The website will be linked with, on the website will be, will also be present, will be present information about um, the touristic facilities like, for example, hotels, restaurants, and already existing uh, culture roads, because may, many of our uh, archaeotouristic attractions are near the existing roads, for example, bicycle paths. The question is where we can find information about them. Mm, social media, the way of communication, uh, the way of presenting the information, it's a very important uh, part of the, uh, of the of this uh, project. That's why we started working with the social media. Right now we are on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube channel. We are testing various forms of uh, presenting uh, the, uh, the information. And during the next year, uh, we want to focus, we want to develop this uh, area, which is very, very important. But the question is, what next? We have a lot of elements uh, which, in which we linked with uh, this uh, archaeology place of power and ritual. Uh, the, what is next? Durability. Um, the project will create by this all activities a network of archaeological centers in the South Baltic area for, uh, uh, for dissemination and development, development of archaeotourism. Uh, this place already exists at um, function at Upoka. It's archaeological, archaeological 
archaeological center uh, of Upokra, which is also a um, form of inspiration uh, for us. And similar places will be created uh, on Borhorn as K and uh, at Wisło uh, Ujście Fortress. Down there will be possible to find uh, all information related with our activities, uh, with acti our activities related to Archaeobal project, to find information about archaeotouristic uh, attractions, and also will be the places where the uh, open excavations, uh, which are part of our route, uh, will be uh, where will where they will be uh, continued. Uh, so you may see that in Archaeobal project we have uh, quite a big amount of activities which uh, are linked uh, each other and which want to show by the different way of presenting and promoting the heritage of the South Baltic uh, Sea region. However, we are very open to uh, cooperation with institutions. Uh, we have a big and great support from um, touristic organizations like Stenline, uh, like uh, B North um, um, Company, uh, Stavia Archaeologia from Lithuania. We have also support from media. It's the Północ's Scandinavian magazine and uh, Archaeologia Żywes Living, well, let's say Living Archaeology is one of the biggest uh, popular science magazine uh, in Poland. Now, we are very open to cooperation also with other institutions. So if you really would like to join us and to start um, develop the idea of archaeotourism, you're all very welcome. You may always write to us on our project um, email. It's uh, archaeobalt.gmail.com. Uh, so we are very, very welcome. So thank you very much and the end. Yeah. <clears throat> thank you, Carolina, for this uh, uh, overview. And um, we have a question from Robert Pütlos, who uh, has been fascinated by a specific slide of yours, and that is the sacred groove slide. So if you can flip to the sacred groove slide. Let's see. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so I have to go to the beginning. <laughs> oh, wow. Yes. We, yeah, thank you. And uh, Robert asks uh, if the inlays in this uh, S-shaped uh, uh, fibula or, uh, uh, on, in the left corner, if the uh, inlays are uh, of Amber, and I guess they are not. But uh, let's uh, let's ask the excavator. So uh, please uh, comment on the uh, S-shaped um, uh, object uh, in the left uh, corner. Yes, I think you're referring to millions. Yeah, and uh, this is a find from Upokra, and. Uh, uh, probably from the Merovingian period, and there are uh, semi precious stones. It's not amber. Yeah. Uh, so, um, so the answer is uh, for Robert is uh, no, it's not amber. Then uh, Paulina uh, Jakubiuk uh, asks uh, and uh, greets us and says, hi, uh, are you planning any publications from the project? So yes, that's- Yes, we are planning that the publication of the main project results uh, in which we want to present our observations uh, related to archaeotourism is the strategy which we'll prepare uh, at the end of the project. So we are creating the network of archaeotouristic centers and we are preparing our let's say, suggestions guidelines, which will be present in the main rapport. 
And uh, I think that we will uh, go and uh, work with uh, more scientific publication or series with, uh, of articles. Yeah. Um, are there any more uh, questions? Because according to our time, we are uh, right on spot. So uh, thank you, Carolina. And uh, please uh, stop your share. Yes, stop share. So thank you. And mute the, 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 the microphone. <laughs> and mute the microphone. Yeah, thank you. And uh, so uh, I will welcome uh, Professor Mats uh, Orslund from uh, Lund uh, University. And we look very much forward to hear his uh, presentation. Uh, and I'm sure uh, he will, um, yeah, he will tell us uh, what it is about. Uh, so thank you, and I will mute my. Good, I hope you all can see and hear me. Is sound and vision already uh, running? Good, fine, thank you. Um, I will take you to Upokra, which is a site close to Lund, and I will try to um, give a reference to what is going on, and, but also a short introduction to the site itself, because many of you might not know of the uh, ex extension of the site in space and time. But I will focus mostly on research and uh, public outreach, how we can combine these two things. Um, we have already going on cooperation and regional dissemination uh, on the site. But the Archibald project has created new possibilities, and I try to emphasize them in my lecture. Um, as, a, as a scholar, I'm not used to um, working very much with media or disseminating our results. Of course, we are encouraged to do so, and we do it all, all the time. But to have uh, an ongoing a uh, continuous information flow is very difficult. On this slide, you can see some of the huge, the, the, the very large centers that are well known. You might know Stonehenge, um, but there are several others in Europe. Bibracte in, in France is a very old site and uh, very um, luckily um, expanding still, combining research museum and ongoing guiding on the site. But how can we manage these sites? We are only living in, um, in, in, in one life as a scholar, and how can we make it, um, make it last? And which concepts can secure uh, lasting information of these results? First, about the, uh, the site itself, Upokra, it's one of the largest sites in a cluster of very interesting centers from the, the Iron Age. Many of them, they come and go from, uh, from the first century AD and disappear. But Upokra is one of the few sites that actually lingers on for a very, very long time. It's supposed to be a center from 200 AD, late Roman Iron Age, up to it's, um, its closure as a central place in the end of the 10th century. And I'll give you some proportions. Uh, if you look at this map, which is uh, showing the phosphates in the plain of, of uh, southwest Skåne, it's Lund and Malmö, and in between them you can see a, a fantastic let's see yeah, a pencil a huge site totally black with phosphates indicating an ongoing settlement for many many years many centuries actually and it contrasts with the rest of the small blobs uh, on the plain on the site um, we are mostly focusing on the settlement and the findings but we must think about Upokra as a part of a larger landscape, which you can see here, between the rivers of Segeo in the south 
and here are all in the north. In between those small rivers, we have probably a domain with a large estate, which is Upokra. If we put the site Upokra, which is 40 hectares, inside the medieval boundaries of Lund, we get the picture you can see on the left side here. Um, it's rather big, so it's as big as medieval Lund in some sense, or the old town in Stockholm. Um, and we can also see some proportions in quantity. We have 28,000 metal artifacts found through metal detecting. And many of the very, very nice people from Bornholm have been cooperating with us for several years. Um, we have hundreds of houses and deposits 1.5 to 2 meters deep, but only 0.1% uh, is investigated. So we have a serious problem to understand how the settlement worked through time and space. We also have a very high proportion of high quality artisanal production from all through the Iron Age, which points out the ambition of the dynasties living here. We also have interregional trade, um, uh, signals of interregional trade. However, we mustn't look at this site as a town or a trading place. It's more like, like um, a large domain with an estate, which draws interest to it with, um, with a great agrarian surplus. It's also a com complex site, uh, which is very difficult to understand if we haven't, ex we haven't excavated so much. And it's also a, um, a, a very strong continuity over time, as you can see, beginning from 100 uh, BC until second half of the 10th century. Uh, this map from uh, Manuel Gabler's dissertation from 2018 shows the, uh, the, uh, the spread of all the metal artifacts. From 1996, the uh, Professor Emeriti, uh, Lars Larsen and Birgitta Hord worked a lot with the site and found a tremendously amount of artifacts, which shows that the site was already large and populated by several <clears throat> groups of houses uh, from the birth of Christ. Uh, the interpretation Manuel Gabler has done with the Ludwig Boltzmann Institute in Vienna um, has exposed groups of houses in clusters. You can see the sub areas here from his dissertation. And uh, through the years, we have focused very much on finding out if the, the, all these houses are small uh, villages themselves, or if you have different zones of func different functional zones, which is um, uh, which is one question we're working with right now. If we center on the church in Upokra and uh, on the the um, the few but very important sites excavated on um, uh, in the area, you can see the um, uh, the red circle encircling a huge hall building to the left and a smaller black black building with um, with four post holes on the right of that and this is you could say the political and religious center of upokra um Birgitta Hord and Lars Larsen uh, and the colleagues made excavations in the 2000s and had a uh, you could say stroke luck, stroke gold, finding this temple, which is one of the only temples we have um, a notion of in northern northern Europe. And uh, the um, extraordinary situation is that we have several floor layers, up to nine floor layers, from 200 AD to mid 10th century, showing that there was a tremendous effort being made to maintain the temple or cult house for several several hundreds of years despite the fact that the dynasties probably changed over time so this is the center for the rituals and riches the hall and the temple and it's a part of a germanic worldview you could say a duality where you had social display and recurrent gatherings 
very much important for the, um, uh, the community itself, not only on site, but also on a much, much wider scale, probably the whole uh, west of Scania. But luck never lasts, as we say. And uh, in the end of the 10th century, there was a big change, political change, um, with a dynasty from Jutland taking over the eastern part of the Danish realm. And they moved from Upokra to Lund. Upokra is still there, but it lost its importance as a center. And Lund was uh, established around 970, 980. And it's only five kilometers away, which is a bit strange. Why move over to, to uh, the other side of the river? And we have many different uh, ideas of why, why that happened. Uh, and many of us think it has to do with the very, very continuous and long and strong pagan tradition that, that lingered in, in Upokra. But still, when uh, the, uh, the king established his royal estate in Lund, he still had Upokra as a pantry. It was later donated to the cathedral in, in Lund in 1085. And uh, that shows that it was still an economic, very important place. So that was a very short introduction to the Upokra site. I could go on for two hours about it, but uh, just to know a little. And the, the important questions for today are directed towards um, the dissemination of the knowledge we have there. And already before the Archeobalt project uh, came on, we had um, already ongoing cooperation with regional partners. Partners, Of course, one of our most, most important partners is the Historical Museum of Lund University, which is uh, responsible for the artifacts, for taking care of them, storage, but also exhibitions, guided tours, and pedagogical work. And, uh, it is uh, the artifacts are displayed in the exhibition Barbaricum. Hopefully, we will in the, in, in the future have uh, funding for changing the exhibition and also rebuild it. Another important part is the Upokra Archaeological Center, which is a foundation um, situated out in Upokra, working with, uh, with brilliant programs for schools an archaeology school for pupils, as you can see here, lectures for the public, the guides and our colleagues working there, they go out in the schools and also um, work a lot with, uh, with the guided tours in different languages. So of course, they have already from the beginning, since, um, since they started in 2009, been very important for us. And uh, through the archaeological, the Upok Archaeological Center, there's also uh, started a very, very nice and interesting event every year, the Vendel Days. The Merovingian period is enhanced. And I think it's brilliant because we are so overwhelmed with Viking Age in Scandinavia. It's very popular. So um, if we look at the artifact assemblages and also some of the larger settlements around Upokra, it's actually the, the Vendel period and the form of uh, migration period that is the most obvious periods of wealth on the site. It's extremely wealthy with gold and international connections, but it's, uh, it takes a pedagogical effort to explain this to the public. The public demands Vikings when they come to Scandinavia, but it is... Um, um, it's interesting to change the views. So you could say it's a, a scholarly effort as, a, as well as a um, very nice um, effort by the uh, Upokra Archaeological Center to try to turn the heads and the minds a little bit away from the Vikings to this more um, sophisticated period with gold, amber and, and silver. The, um, this has been going on for some years now, two or three years. And last year, there were 7,000 visitors coming on very two very sunny and hot days uh, in the summer. 
In archaeology, coming from university, we don't have these possibilities as the museum and the archaeological center have. Uh, of course, we always have a possibility to contact the press, all sorts of media. And the Archibald project has given us a fantastic opportunity to expand the interfaces with the public. Um, we are maintaining our yearly seminar excavations at Upokra and focusing the, um, the, the last two years and in, in the, the future couple of years on a very, um, you could say, simple host, household site within this huge settlement. There has been so much focus on the center of the settlement, of the, the temple and the whole building. So we need to know what ordinary people did. Mr. and Mrs. Smith, how did they live and what did they do? And we find uh, brilliant things like uh, a lot of beads, of course, that uh, reticella piece, the small piece down to the left. That's a goblet, a glass vessel from the continent being used during the Merovingian Viking Age period here. So it was not poor people, you could say, that was, but it's an ordinary household. The students, they are cooperating with the Upokra Archaeological Center and try to enhance the experience of the visitors to the center. Cooperating with the guides from the center, the students can present the everyday findings straight from the earth to the people coming. And they also get, uh, the students themselves get uh, fantastic op opportunities to, to um, talk to people and uh, learn how to behave with large groups, which is splendid. But we also have other types of public outreach. Thanks to the Archibald project, we cooperate with other NGOs like this Scanian Heritage Association, um, making bus tours with a stop in, in, uh, in Upokra. This was a very rainy day, as you can see, but still people, hundreds of people came and uh, participated. We have also had several lectures organized by the Rotary Societies in the region and also other smaller museums. So we are not only disseminating our experiences on site, but we are reaching out to other places with, um, with other people. But also, since Upokra is a national interest, we try to take, um, get in touch with, uh, with uh, other regions. And of course, Stockholm is the capital and we have to be present there. We had, lecture, we had a lecture at the State Historical Museum, which is the, the biggest museum in Sweden, with the uh, Swedish Antiquities Association that brought at least 150 people, 200 people to, to the lecture. So we could see that uh, Upokra um, is very interesting, not only for people here in the South Baltic region, but also for on a national basis. But Archibald, the Archibald project is a transnational experience. And uh, there are difficulties with transnational cultural heritage sites. Uh, we have the language problem. My Polish is not so well. And uh, I can speak a little Danish, so, so to speak. But how do we cope with, with these difficulties? And also, uh, how can we bring our sites together? We use 360 degrees cameras uh, to show our sites. We just started and we will launch it in, uh, uh, as, as a full experience this summer. So visitors can participate using virtual glasses on site. They can, they can stand exactly on the spot where the camera has been and move in time to the, um, uh, the time when they, they had took the video, so to speak. But we can also do armchair traveling, which is today a very <laughs> good idea with the pan pandemia going on. Um, but virtual experiences, they are not enough. As an archeologist, I love physical experiences, the landscape, the artifacts to be present. And uh, there is a huge interest in coming to to um, uh, excavations 
just to watch archaeologists, to just to, to watch how we work and how we reach our conclusions. So we have some challenges for the future. We have done a lot of interesting things. And uh, I put some questions here, uh, which could be used for discussions later on in the end of this webinar. How can we improve the transnational experiences of our sites by connecting common histories? Of course, uh, being a medieval archeologist, for me, it's natural to talk about the Christianization process in the end of the 10th century, which is on exactly the same time in Piast, Poland, in Denmark, and um, the, it's starting in Sweden at least. Also, during that period, there were a lot of intermarriages uh, and political ordeals between uh, Poland, Denmark, and Sweden. We must also consider some theoretical aspects like building the consciousness how cultural heritage and history is created, used and abused, and ask ourselves, what kind of narratives are we producing or reproducing in our project? Um, and also, since we are dealing with very dynamic sites, how is it possible to present this to a public without losing the focus, the, the process through time and the political and economic change? And there's also, an, you could say, an enigma in our own project. Sustainable archaeological routes can be seen as a contradiction. Actually, we shouldn't travel, we shouldn't use gasoline or planes or ferries, destroying our, our Mother Earth. But how can we cope with this? It's, uh, when, it's, uh, when it is very important to see the sites, to experience the landscape, and as a last question, how can we strengthen the connections with commercial partners that are outside our own circle of, of friends and colleagues and a public that comes running whenever there is an archeological excavation? How can we cooperate with commercial partners? And um, Carolina, you touched a little about, uh, touch this a little in the end of your lecture. So I hope that will, this will be, uh, a good start for discussions later, and uh, thank you for listening. Well, uh, thank you, Mats, for this uh, brilliant talk and also for uh, um, opening the uh, discussion with uh, interesting uh, questions. And uh, thank you for uh, um, ending uh, our uh, current migration period uh, <laughs> which <laughs> <laughs> yeah so um yeah uh, let's see um there is one question for you but it's on the edges but it i'll say malena asks if uh, the summer course for university students are still going to be held this summer uh, on the background of the COVID-19? Uh, yes, it is actually. I have the permit from um, the Dean uh, that we are outside and we are trying to, to keep the distance and uh, to cooperate. So we will, I had a go with the, uh, with the Dean of the faculty here. Do you think you also could uh move your your team to uh, to denmark and <laughs> if you let us in <laughs> if you let us in glad to uh, sorry okay yeah. uh thank you very much we have um still five minutes according to a schedule so if anybody has a uh, question or comment um there is a space for questions and and, and, and comments if that is not the case, then I have the pleasure of uh, giving the word to uh, Finn Ola Nielsen from uh, Bornholms Museum. Welcome, Finn Ola. And uh, I know you are a big fan of uh, information technology. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so I, I, I can kind of so, uh, <laughs> yeah, I can see I can see you have a wingman uh, next to you, uh, <laughs> but uh, I know you're an excellent uh, presenter. So I uh, 
I look very much forward uh, to hear your presentations on the excavations at uh, Sordemul. So please. Yeah, thank you. Um, it's it's more or less the same story as as, uh, as Matt's told about the uh, Sordemul, and uh, and um, uh, it's actually. Um, we say my thoughts about Sordemul that uh, that we didn't have so much Viking. I will turn up with this uh, lecture to say I have to read, uh, think about this. But um, um, we we start to say to show an old map where, where it's from the Viking period, it's around uh, 890, uh, where we can see Borgendalen. That's the the first name we see Bornholm is mentioned as, and we sure it is Bornholm Borgendalen. Uh, but we also can see that that's uh, the, the collaboration we have here is on a line, actually. We have in the West uh, uh, Oz, and then we have uh, Lund and Bornholm and Gidansk. And uh, can you see it's actually to draw a, a, a line? I, I didn't really observe that before. So, but that was not just, just a coincidence that we uh, collaborate. Um, Bornholm is actually part of Scania land. So it's it's very uh, it's uh, but lore and, and for for yeah centuries has been very very close to to Scania when Scania was Danish, uh, and and Bornholm is still by a coincidence still <laughs> Danish, uh, but uh, it also have a, a a story that is very similar to Upoka, uh, and that's the story I will I will tell you here. So um, the next uh, slide is uh, this uh, collaboration we have. And, uh, and I, I have to apologize for Matt that uh, Upoka is not mentioned here. And uh, I don't know whether you're on so often. So, <laughs> <laughs> so it, uh, we have a Polish place near Krakow that is mentioned, but uh, Upoka is not mentioned. But um, um, we, we are glad that we are a part in, in, in this uh, Archibel project and that we not only have one place, we have two places on, on, on Bonhorn. Uh, I return to this. But um, uh, I will give a short uh, presentation of, uh, of uh, Sordemul, what we think it is now, and, uh, and some of the finds from, from the excavation last year, where we have uh, uh, O's uh, students, a big group under the leading of Jens, and, and then we have uh, Kaulina, uh, and, and Patrick with a smaller group in, in, in September. Uh, but we also have students from, uh, from uh, Lund, uh, actually. But uh, one of them was, uh, is a Bornholmer. So, uh, yeah. Um, but uh, let's take the next. And uh, that's to, to say what is uh, Sonmul known for. It, it's known for these uh, thousands of, of Gulkuba. And, and um, Karolina mentioned there were two. 1,600, but we're up to 2,800 now. So the figure, it, it, it's just growing because they, they go with the metal sector and they just had a new, uh, can we see, uh, technology with the high frequency detector that can locate these uh, small gold uh, figures. And, and uh, the, we say all the, the metal detectors they had before couldn't do that. But now we have uh, the possibility to find uh, new finds, and and they find um, up to now we have more than sixty uh, gulgubur for for this season. Um, you can see on this uh, map that is called Gulhul and Smering, and that's the place that uh, Kaulina mentioned. And uh, that's uh, if you took at the center of, of, of Bornholm, is very close to the center, and Sormul is in the, the eastern corner near Svenike. Yeah, next picture. And Sormul is, is uh, actually black. It's called the black soil. And it's visible when it's uh, cultivated, you can see the black soil. But it's not the only place where we have the black soil, but this is the, the central part of the black soil. And Sormul is not uh, this, it's, it's uh, a system of uh, settlements um, that uh, surrounds this, uh, this uh, black soil area you can see in, in, in the central part of the picture. So we take the next and, and you can see there's uh, Sordemul is in, in the center and uh, we have some what we call satellites settlements. Um, we, we think it's, um, <clears throat> it's, we don't talk about villages on, on Bornholm, 
But if, if we should talk about a village, it, it is uh, uh, Sormuli is a candidate. We, we discuss what, what it really is. Uh, but uh, I think the, the, the question is uh, very similar to what we see in Upoka, that, um, that we have a, a center uh, and, and then we have some, uh, uh, let say, supporters. We have uh, farmsteads that support this center. And uh, what here we have here on, on Sormul is, is an area that covers more than one square kilometer. But it's not all of this that is, is uh, um, we say, built because there's a lot of, of uh, wet areas, a lot of areas that couldn't be uh, habitated. But, but, uh, we all, but we actually also have an area that is wet and that is habitated. So, so it, it is a little bit uh, different, but it's not, as we say, if you, you look at this habitated area, it's not as big as Upoka. Upoka is still Big Brother. Uh, we have to realize that bon sort of mul, it uh, is not that big as uh, uh, Upoka. But it has a very interesting structure because uh, uh, when you compare it to so Upoka, we say it's, it's more like a, a black box. We have the topography that uh, can tell us about the difference in, in how uh, such a center was built up. And, and my, um, I say what I uh, pronounce is that uh, Sormul is actually uh, a gift for us, uh, that it, it, we have a landscape that actually can tell us what this is about. Uh, yeah, next. Uh, and here we can see on, on, on the LIDAR uh, map uh, uh, the settlements area and, and it is not uh, all of it because uh, actually we haven't been on every square meter. We still, in collaboration with the volunteer archaeologists, try to, to cover this area. I have to say we don't know every detail on this area. The problem is that it's so huge. And it, uh, the most, uh, we say, uh, intensive uh, investigation is on the central part. We still have a lot uh, more to do to know it in detail. Yeah, next. Here we have it uh, on, um, we say, uh, this uh, habitation and it covers all, uh, we say, periods from, from the pre-Roman until the, the Viking period. And you can see how much it covers. And it's on the, the coastline, we have uh, Svenike, the, uh, the modern uh, city of Svenike. And uh, it, it just to, sh to show how uh, huge an area it, it is, yeah. And this is uh, linked to, uh, uh, to say we, the explanation why we have a, a Sonomul, why we have a center here is uh, the port of trades, it's, it's uh, the, harbors that is uh, natural harbors that is linked to this area uh, on, on Bornholm and that we also have the best soil where we know on Bornholm is in this area so we, we can see that they that they have their agriculture could uh, make an outcome and, and that they they could benefit from the their geographical position in the Baltic to be uh, a place that they uh, uh, the traders could could rest and have uh, fresh water and, 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 and have uh, something to, to eat. And there we can see uh, there's built up a center that has lasted for, I'd say at least thousand years, but we believe it's actually much earlier. We may think my idea is actually they go back to the Neolithic. Yeah. Here we can see a picture from uh, Svenike and in the background, uh, that is uh, Sonomul, and it's uh, on the we say background to the to the right. Uh, and uh, there, if someone can see it, it's it's black, the black soils area. But uh, the natural harbor, the most important harbor, is Wien. That's uh, from the center, just the right from the center. There's a natural harbor, and we can see the roads go up there directly to the center. And most of this road still exists. So it's, it's uh, we call it the Bornholms via Apia. Next. And, uh, but if you look at, at the topographic map, uh, you can see that um, uh, the red area is, is uh, the highest level. And you can see that Sormul is, is um, can we say, in, in a remote distance from the, the coast. Uh, maybe someone maybe could say in a safe dif distance from, from, from the coast. And uh, it is a very high uh, position. In the next picture, I'll show you the landscape. You can look down from, from the Sodomul down to the coast. Uh, so it it's, has a very, very uh, dominant uh, position 
though it's not the highest position in uh, in the landscape, but it's uh, I think they, they chose this uh, position for for the central part of Sodom, uh, where we have a temple uh, that uh, it is had to do with the sunrise and it has to do that they could defend this place. Next. Here we have some phosphate and, and the red color is uh, this where we have the highest uh, percentage of, of phosphate and, and the, the black uh, is that, uh, what Matt also showed on Upoka, uh, it's uh, the detector finds. So we can see that uh, in the central part, it, it's, uh, they have there a lot of, of, of metal uh, detector finds there. But I have to say again, uh, all the area is not completed. Um, we could have improved and we work with this to do it a, a, a better, um, uh, could we say, detector uh, uh, search because we know that's more, much more. This is uh, the Roman period. Uh, we know that uh, we we have already in the pre-Roman. We, we we can see that uh, the start, but we can see we have a picture of a center in the Roman period, at least from around uh, 200 AD. We can see that the center is is there, uh, and 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 actually, what we did in this spring is try to investigate some of the satellite settlements. And we can see that's a lot of late Roman Iron Age, a period from two to three hundred. We find them everywhere, so we have a center already in the Roman period, as you have in uh, Upoka, uh, and the Germanic. Next shows the same picture uh, with the center and the satellites that uh, surround uh, the center. Uh, and then in Viking, less. But um, it doesn't mean that, uh, at, that uh, we don't uh, have a center there. Um, as, as I said in the beginning, I said uh, in, in when we have these uh, written sources about Bugendaland, we didn't have any king uh, at Sodomul because the written sources tell about that uh, Bornholm has its own king. Uh, and I said, definitely he's not living at Sodomul. And I think I had to, to maybe to change that theory. And that's happened for our archaeologists. We have to, sometimes we have to change and we had to realize, oh, maybe we're not 100% right. Next. Here we have uh, our temple at Sodomul. And um, you, what you can see is, um, in the northern part, uh, there are some, some lines, and it's, it's an excavation done by Margrethe Watt in uh, 1986 and 1987. And, and what we tr I tried to do with, um, uh, with the, the yellow, uh, it's the, the two dots there, is to try to say that there could be an in, a gate there, an entrance to, into the temple yard, and uh, just outside the temple yard, 2,300 gold follies was found. So we, and we know that it, it was not found the gold, most of the gold there is, was not found in situ. Uh, and here is a picture showing uh, uh, again. Uh, and also the, the, we say the background is uh, a map from the same people that uh, did the geo uh, radar at uh, Upokan. Uh, we had the, the chance also to collaborate with Ludwig Boltzmann Institute in Vienna. And uh, we do that because we know they are the best. And uh, and and we, uh, I saw that when when uh, we were uh, pres uh, had the presentation of the of the, the images from from Ubok, uh, and I said we want these people to to do a sort of mul, and uh, and uh, I collaborate with Imo uh, Trinks and 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 the leader Wolfgang Neubauer. Uh, and uh, they, uh, Imo Trinks had a special uh, interest in Bornholm because he, he's familiar with Bornholm. He's been here on vacation since he was eight years old. So um, uh, he, he was familiar with Bornholm and, and they did a lot of, um, uh, of uh, 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 could we say, uh, mapping and they covered uh, 30 hectare. Um, they have uh, the interpretation here uh, of, of the temple area that is in the center and uh, we can uh, we can see that that uh, the gold uh, guba that uh, Margrethe Watt excavated is outside the temple. But that's also the the results from excavation. You could see that they they didn't were there originally. They were all as thrown was thrown out from from the temple. But what's special here on Sodomul is that we also have what I call a temple yard. It is surrounding by 
a fence. And uh, it, it is, uh, I don't uh, see this on, on, on other places that we have such a clear f uh, fence with, with what I call a, a Western and an Eastern foreyard. And, and, uh, and uh, definitely in the South, we can see there's an entrance. But we also have other buildings. That, that's uh, buildings I compared again with Upoka, and I call them the King's Hall that, that is on the southern side of, uh, of the temple. But we also have uh, other uh, large houses, uh, on, you see them in the bottom of, of, of this picture. And, and um, one of the uh, volunteer most known, Klaus Thorsen, just gave me a print where he found his last gold, and it was found in these long houses. This is from the migration period. So we had had problem to date these buildings, the long buildings in the southern part of, the, of this picture. But now we think that this is Germanic uh, Iron Age as well. Yeah, next. And, and uh, we find Goldgruber, uh, yeah, every time we go there uh, at uh, Sonmul, uh, there is new and it's up to 60 uh, this uh, season. Next. Here, what is interesting is that um, that we uh, find them just south of the old excavation from 1986 to 87. It what we call the temple building. And it's uh, the temple building is with the white dots and uh, the temple yard is also with the white dots. And uh, you can see there's a grid and it's uh, excavation uh, to the right. It's from uh, Jens's excavation. Uh, and in the middle, it's uh, from the Gdansk and Bornholz Museum's excavation. And the, and the orange dot is Goldgruber that was found by the, the water sea. And uh, this is the picture of, of uh, the full picture of uh, the area that uh, Ludwig Boltzmann Institute, they have uh, covered. And uh, uh, it's covered uh, most of, of the, the, the central. We, we, we're still missing a, a small uh, triangle in the northern part. But then we have uh, all the central part of Sodomul is covered. And the picture that shows us is that there is defense systems around the, the temple area. We have uh, not only one, we have two systems. One around the, what we call the temple area, and then a larger uh, around. The problem with this is what is contemporary. We don't know that yet. Uh, and that's what we hope that uh, we can have some help from the cultural heritage to, to um, investigate here in August, September. And I'm still, I applied, I'm still waiting for, for an answer to, to say, will they give us the money so we can, so we can uh, see uh, and, and try to date uh, the, the images that uh, we have here on the georadar. The georadar gives us like at Upokwa, uh, as, as an archeologist, a totally new, I would call it revolutionary picture to see what is underground, what is in the earth, because they can measure down to one and a half meter. They could probably easily go deeper, but uh, at Sodmul we don't have to go deeper than uh, 1.2 meters because that's the, that's uh, the, uh, the thickness of, of the, the layer. But what we can see here and what we can observe by doing the field walking here, because we've made a, a new uh, uh, field survey here uh, covering some four hectare area. It, um, and we can see that uh, the sort of mool, the, the, the black soil area is uh, not uh, covering a very big area. It's very uh, concentrated to the central part where we have the temple building. And it also shows us that um, we can see that uh, there is um, a, a not what we could call, someone talked about a pre-town, some, some uh, kind of, of uh, uh, central place built up here. We can see there is, but we don't have many buildings. The most of, of, of uh, the area here is actually uh, uh, a few buildings and then the temple. But the, 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 the surrounding areas with, with satellite settlements, that's, that's building the, the, the we say, the, the pre-town area. So that's what the links are. But what's surprising for me that we didn't have that many building in the central part. Yeah. And here is the, the, the first suggestion from, from uh, uh, Vienna Group, uh, Ludwig Boltzmann, uh, and to, to show this uh, with the, 
Yellow is the, the surrounding fortification. In, in the building, there's a black line. I think it's black. Uh, that's surrounding the temple area. So there's a double system. And then to the left from the center, we can see there's some, uh, I think more uh, brown areas. That's a se settlement area, the black soil area that is linked to the satellite settlements. Yeah. Uh, why claim it's it's a king's place? Uh, it's uh, some of the Gulgubar, and it actually is only one where we can see that he has a crown. He has long hair. We know that from the Merovinger, the written sources that the nobles, the kings, they were long hair. So that was a part of their, uh, I say, uh, um, signature that, uh, that they, they could uh, be um, uh, visited, uh, they could be um, seen with the long hair, it, it, that could be identified as nobles. Yeah. And we also have this uh, ring, uh, and it's being brought on, on the sword that it's uh, for uh, a bodyguard. The king's bodyguard got such a ring uh, and we found one of them in gold from here on Sunwood. And here we have the warrior and he is a little bit scary, but he doesn't have a ring on his, uh, his sword. So he probably is not a king's man, but he's a warrior, definitely. Next. Um, what we did uh, in 2019 is that we uh, excavated uh, the, the blue area um, we have with, with the green because we had planned that we should next week we should start with the excavation and uh, and Jens were, and his students were meant to link uh, the blue areas and uh, uncover a, a part of the northeastern part of the temple area. So um, um, we have to wait to 2021 to do that. Um, but I would just to show you some of the, the finds that we did uh, in uh, two last year in 2019. So they comes here with a lot of, of uh, glass from uh, and glass beads. Yeah, we just continue. Uh, amber, uh, bones, and a horse. Um, Colina showed that before. So, and uh, what uh, the reason why we did uh, and find so much is that we water seeped every, uh, um, uh, we say every square meter. And uh, this was the, the outcome of the, the gold follies. And, but we also found some special uh, import, and this is what we call terra nigra. Uh, we know that from the Roman, it's, it's terra sigillata, it's red, but we also have a, 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 um, a Roman uh, ware that is black, and it's called terra nigra. And I don't think that we have many of this in Scandinavia. But then the last thing is that we also found Baltic ware, and that's uh, the uh, finds for that, uh, Matt says we were working on Baltic Ware and did his uh, doctor on that. But we found that at Sodomul. And that gives me the chance to say maybe I was a little bit wrong to say we didn't have any Vikings there at the temple area. We and definitely we have Baltic Ware in, in, in the central part. The last uh, new finds is this. Um, we think maybe it, uh, it's the same question that uh, we have uh, on uh, before. When Matt's, when, when you were talking about this, uh, it's not glass, it's not amber. Uh, it's the stone, and we think maybe it could be a part of, of a bird's eye, maybe a feeble eye. We don't know. This is so, so small piece. Next, this is a very special. I haven't seen that before. Uh, just new finds uh, gold. Next, and this is the last from the lung house, south from the the temple area that Klaus just found. And this is uh, the finds from Saturday. Uh, they go there every weekend. They will also go there on, on uh, now, uh, Saturday, and uh, probably the last chance they have be uh, before the crop. But uh, Sormul is also special, uh, we'll say, with special finds. This is a, a golden neck necklet, and uh, this is found uh, not exactly at Sormul, but next to one of the, what it could maybe could be called one of the satellites. Um, but uh, this is uh, the, with the red area, we have the temple area, and this is where we uh, plan to, to continue in 2021. And uh, we have uh, here um, built up uh, with the blue, uh, also a parking place with the exhibition, uh, a place where the, uh, the visitors could uh, uh, meet the archaeologists. And uh, in, in the first four weeks in, in April, no, May, June uh, 2019, we, it was Jens' student that uh, came there and, um, 
uh, met the, the public and follow them up to or send them up to to the the temple area they had also we had some podcasts some station that was built up so the some of them anyway because we there were too many so not everyone could have to listen to a podcast but they were sent up to the center where other students took care of the visitors and i know yes it was a great success they were they were so pleased about uh, uh, the way uh, your students took care of them and um, <clears throat> What is the, uh, the intention with the Soul Mall? We have uh, planned to, to maybe to do something on, on, on the place. Uh, anyway, we, we will save it. It will not be uh, cultivated again. We will try to build something up there, but we will not, of course, we will not build a temple there, but maybe we will build up a virtual temple. And um, but I think that will let that be to my successes. As I said, I'm a dinosaur, but I, I also can see the possibilities of, uh, of what the new technology can make. And it is possible that uh, we can uh, build up something uh, for, for the public. Uh, and uh, definitely there's a, a big uh, demand, to say, from the local people that uh, we should uh, treat this as a, a uh, sacred uh, place and, and build this as, uh, uh, as a, a, a place to, to, to visit and, and we, we work with this and we work together with the landowner to do something uh, about this that, that makes it real. But what we the first step could be, uh, we have the book here and there's an English version it's from 2009 and uh, maybe the first uh, step would be to uh, to build up uh, or make a new uh, publication uh, in, in English about uh, the status of, of Sodomu uh, today. So that's, I think that would be the first step from here. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Finola, for uh, this uh, fantastic presentation and also for keeping uh, inside the time slot. I mean, uh, it's not a gift everybody has, uh, so uh, so thank you very much. Um, it makes my job very easy, and um, so uh, and I will also thank you for your uh, uh, credits uh, to our student group. I will pass uh, them uh, on to to them uh, in due time. Now uh, we have um, yeah we are ahead of uh, schedule, so uh, so if you. Uh, out there uh, or in here in the panel have any questions or comments uh, we can easily um, manage that so um, Matt and, and Laura um, any questions? I asked a question of Fanula um, I was really interested in the role of the metal detectors who are scanning the site so, still and finding all the gold. How do you interact with them as archaeologists? Do you have a good relationship? Yeah, it, it, it's almost family. So I, I know them very well. So and that's why I, I have um, I, I trust them 100 percent. So uh, but but we also, uh, uh, of course, we can see that uh we we, we ha have also groups uh, we have some persons on Bonhom that we don't rely on actually so uh, and, but we have a, a connection with the neighbors and uh, so they 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 follow and so uh, to be sure if it's the right people we have to go there <laughs> so you know um they they are working so fantastic and uh, and that's a gift for us that uh, we can have these volunteers to do this uh, yeah to cover it. The problem that we have is that uh, it is difficult to get them out to, to work on areas where we, where we don't expect or where we think, uh, uh, yeah, maybe they can have one fine, but uh, it is for us, it's important that they cover all the area and, and a little bit hard sometimes to send them out to areas that we don't believe there's anything here, but couldn't you do that? That's a little bit hard. I can imagine that. <laughs> Yeah, but also they are organized on a, on a group. There's a, it's an organized group of uh, metal detectors. I mean, they're not just popping up from the middle of nowhere. Uh, they're already an, an organization which uh, have already, uh, you know, a list of members 
and they work together. They uh, check the areas where they're going to be working. So they're pretty well organized and they're working normally in contact with the museum. So that makes the work a lot easier. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was uh, Nick Caretta, uh, whom you could, yeah, there he is. Uh, so uh, Nick is uh, a partner in this uh, project. Now, um, and uh, also Finola, uh, thank you about, uh, on the comments of, uh, of uh, family. Um, I mean, um, I mean, uh, you you seem to have, let's say, uh, not dysfunctional families, uh, but uh, families are uh, can be um, quite a pain, I, I must say. So, uh, yeah. <clears throat> now, um, concerning the uh, let's say the uh, the visitors on Sotomol uh, last year, we I think we had one thousand seven hundred visitors isn't that true finola yeah in, in when you were there yeah yeah and then we have some i think 700 in the, in the september yeah when, when colina was there yeah so all in all uh let's say uh 2400 visitors mm -hmm. around yeah yeah and um and what they uh, what the visitors expressed uh, was uh, that they found it extremely interesting to be involved and to see that uh, um, archaeology uh, in uh, real time and to see all the processes. So Bornholm's museum had done a fantastic job of uh, creating a, a, let's say, a mobile lab. So any, any any process which would be is possible to uh, let's say to move out uh, into the field was moved out. So the uh, first uh, the recording, the uh, first conservation of the objects, the uh, um, everything and uh, and a computer lab, everything was done on site. Uh, so and then Bonhoeffer's museum also had. Um, uh, established two uh, containers uh, at the parking area where then uh, people were welcomed but also were able to see uh, let's say uh, exhibition areas. So um, let's see um, on questions um, there is one from Malene uh, who says I was thinking about when you mentioned that Sotomul was built there it was because of the sunrise could you please elaborate on that? So that's for you, Finola. <laughs> yeah, we, we have been there, out there to follow the, the midsummer and the midwinter uh, and, and in March to, to see where did uh, the sunrise really uh, occurred uh, when standing on the, on the temple area. Um, and we can see it, it, it fits, uh, we, we see the temple, it's uh, built east-west so um, in um, in March uh, 1819, so I think maybe it could be also be 20th March. Uh, March, uh, it go uh, it rise uh, in the east exactly, and uh, and and we can see that the, the temple uh, follows these uh, direction. So um, I'm convinced that uh, it, it it's built uh, like a, a, a sun temple. We could also call it an Apollon temple. So, um, uh, but here is in in the the Nordic, but but uh, it, it it is built with with a purpose uh, that uh, that it can follow the sun rays all the year round. Yeah, I must add that uh, Bornholm is one of the sunniest places uh, in uh, in our small kingdom. So um, well, then there is uh, a response already from the uh, from the student group. Uh, two of them uh, who uh, who were uh, at the excavation last year, um, Mira and Anna Sophie ask uh, here um, a few Aarhus University students listening in. In thanks for last summer, Finola. Um, is there any plan to have open days at Sordemul this year? So that is the question. Is there any plans of having sort of open days at Sordemul? Yeah, not, not at this point. I think it would be uh, 
uh, not a good statement, but uh, if uh, Mets can do something in September, <laughs> to Boca, <laughs> we, we, we hope maybe we can do something on Bonhorn as well. But, but this, for me, it's too early to say, but um, we, will, we will tell if it's, uh, it's possible. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So we are uh, right on time now, and uh, I will give the word to Carolina and uh, I don't know, B Bartosz um, and um, and um, um, I think uh, yeah, and that is uh, the uh, last presentation before uh, the lunch break. So please, um, Carolina, uh, take it away. Okay, I hope that everything is okay right now. Do you hear me all? Super. Uh, so this time our archaeobalt archaeo returns to the southern part of the Baltic Sea. And together with uh, Bartosz Wędkowski, who is also um, the crew in Archibald, uh, who is also the person responsible for Archibald uh, project from uh, University of Nice, would like to share with you our um, experiences uh, related uh, with um, <clears throat> uh, excavations at Stronghold in uh, Ovid with um, public archaeology, archaeotourism, and its potential uh, in um, <clears throat> an area of the South Baltic uh, Sea region. Uh, Ovid is uh, one of the biggest strongholds uh, in Pomerania, uh, which, is, which is located uh, near um, Starogard Gdański. Oh, it's Oh. Oh, sorry, it doesn't cooperate. Okay, uh, Starogardzański is um, it's this area. Is the place um, from let's say from a Gdańsk agglomeration perspective is middle size uh, city where I live less than fifty thousand people. And the distance between the Starogdansky and Tri City is around 40, 50 kilometers. Uh, it is possible uh, to get down there by the public transport, use the train or the bus, or other option, use the car. And from perspective, um, from um, ex excavations at of its perspective, this uh, public transport and communication was important elements. Because, uh, element because um, you had to organize organize your time and find the time uh, to um, come to visit uh, the uh, the place. Uh, archaeological sites in uh, Starogardzki uh, region uh, they are very well uh, presented. We have in this area a few uh, strongholds. And one comment, when I'm using the term stronghold, I'm not thinking about classical fortification. In Polish, it's grodzisko. I would say um, it is kind of fortificated uh, settlement. There's this, kind, this type of um, places had various functions um, and they were very uh, common during the Middle Ages. Now I'm thinking about 10, and uh, 12th century, and uh, of its function, function between uh, 10 and uh, the beginning of 12th century. Uh, but coming back to archaeological sites in Starogard Gdansky region, you may found uh, their uh, strongholds, graveyards, uh, settlements, 
but they are not very well visible uh, in the landscapes. So you have to know uh, on what, uh, what you should look uh, for. And this is uh, also the uh, point uh, in the discussion related with uh, archaeotourism. Um, uh, the, all this information about Ovids uh, um, are from the Middle Ages. Uh, the place name uh, appeared for the first time in the Teutonic document from 1348. Then um, the place was localized at the historical map from 18th, 19th uh, century. And uh, during uh, 19th century also, um, this place appeared in the first, let's say, research publications from the 19th and the beginning of the 20th uh, century. However, at that time, we didn't have any archaeological research at this uh, place. Uh, if we go, uh, if we, we should also focus a little bit on um, archaeological experience and the way of, uh, of working at uh, Stronghold uh, uh, at Ovid. Uh, first, first excavation, let's say regular uh, archaeological excavations we had during the 70s of 20th uh, century. But before that time, there uh, had been organized a kind of field walkings. And for many years, also the local community see that this place is special because of the some reason they had a problem to explain them. Many people during our discussion on the field, especially the, 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 the local um, inhabitants, they told us that they were spending down there their free time when they were a child and they found a lot of pieces of pottery and uh, during the 50s, 70s, 60s, they completely didn't know what to do with that. And they only knew, knew that there's some some very unique and special, uh, special place. Um, archaeological uh, research uh, we, made, we may divide to two phase. Phase, phase first phase is related to uh, this typical research excavations, which took place during the seventies, and uh, after the year two thousand, we have um, excavations related with uh, contract uh, archaeology. Um, at that time, um, a local authority decided that uh, near the stronghold will be built a culture institution, which right now is called Burjisko Ovid, Ovid Stronghold, uh, which is function uh, very well. And they have uh, very interesting um, observations re observation related to um, the archaeology and uh, the visitors, what was very uh, interesting uh, for us during the uh, excavations. Uh, the first season uh, led it, uh, first season of excavation led it by uh, University of Nice, who was in 2017. And together with uh, Bartosz Świątkowski, we had the pleasure to, uh, to work <clears throat> to work down there. Uh, we had also great support from, from, the, uh, from the students. Uh, during this archaeological research, uh, which took place during the 20th century, uh, uh, thir 35 trenches were uh, tested, and um, the 10% of, set, uh, of settlement area has been investigated. So it's relatively, it's not big, part of the uh, settlement, uh, especially, um, as I said, is one of the biggest stronghold in, um, in this part of uh, Pomerania region. However, we are not going to, uh, to excavate all the uh, area. Very important um, part is the localization of stronghold. It's near river, which is called Wierzeca, and is located on the natural hill. So uh, our uh, during the um, research, we focus mostly on the area which is uh, on the top um, of the um, hill. The artifacts uh, which were discovered during the archaeological research, uh, we also have uh, several groups. The most, uh, the, the biggest group were the elements related with everyday life, like spin wheels, 
a fishing hook, knives, spears, uh, wet stones. Mm, they were quite, uh, quite often. And what is very typical for um, stronghold from Middle Ages and early Middle Ages, I'm thinking about 9th and 11th century uh, in Poland, uh, is pottery. Uh, during the excavations, um, uh, during the, the, let's say, first stage of excavations, during the 20th century, down there was discovered uh, around 37,000 pieces of pottery. So it's really big group and there's a lot of work uh, related um, uh, to that. Next group are, I would say, more um, unique uh, artifacts like jewelry made from the bronze. You may see here some presentation um, earrings, uh, temple rings, uh, some pendants, um, and uh, um, artifacts which were made from the silver, which are not so unique. We have, once again, earrings, silver coins, but also we have some, uh, some, some weapons. Mm -hmm. And uh, how the situation looks like after the year 2017, which are, what are our first results and uh, observations um, related to uh, the uh, excavations and interaction with the uh, community, also with the local. Uh, community during the uh, excavations, because this aspect was very important for us uh, from the very, uh, very beginning. Um, our um, research uh, focus, on, as I said, on the top uh, of the hill near the uh, southern uh, embankment. You may hear, see uh, this not very big, um, the trenches here, so you may, uh, you may see it. Now, how we were working in two different, um, in two ways. One, it was, let's say, classical archaeology. We uh, were digging, we were making the regular documentation. As you may see, the excavations were uh, open. It was, there was no problem to come and uh, talk uh, with, with archaeologists, with the students. Uh, we had also support of a uh, local uh, association of metal detectors. Uh, here we have uh, slightly different uh, experiences than in, in Denmark, uh, especially on, on, on Borholm. Um, because working with, uh, working with a metal detector in many areas is not uh, allowed. Uh, here we had the support, the person uh, from uh, uh, COP, it's Club um, Odkrywców Pomorza. It's a group uh, from uh, from Tchev and let's say in general Kochevia region. Um, we had very, I have to say, we have very good uh, cooperation um, because the person who were coming, uh, they were very focused. All elements which were discovered, they were measured by GPS. We put them on a map. Uh, person who are working with metal detector was always supported by the archaeologist or the students, uh, mostly from the master level, uh, who uh, helped and um, uh, with, the, uh, with, with the documentation. They were not allowed to dig very deep. It was around 50 centimeters maximum. So we have to be here very, very uh, careful when we start working uh, with the metal detectors. But I have to say that results were really, uh, really nice and very good. Uh, during the excavations, we uh, found uh, remains of house, uh, unfortunately lock uh, construction. Um, and in 2019, we decided to extend the excavation uh, area. As you may see, we were not uh, dig incredibly deep, but the results were absolutely uh, fantastic. But uh, this situation, which you may see here on, on the photo, also gave a lot of uh, fantastic opportunity people who are coming to start asking the, the question and 
make the, and and uh, be in and for us be in interaction with the people. Um, on one of the corner, uh, we found uh, Owen, and down there were some lucky students who found an offering beginning house construction. It was a uh, doc um, skull. And uh, as you may see, um, we had also some uh, students from Aarhus University. Katrina was uh, one of the persons who was uh, support us uh, during the uh, excavations. And she was the lucky, <laughs> the last day. Um, what kind of artifacts? Sorry, what kind of uh, artifacts we found during two seasons? Uh, last month we finished the work uh, with uh, part of the documentation, the pottery. Right now, only from this not very big area, we have around thirteen thousand pieces of pottery from the whole uh, from these two excavations seasons. So you may see how rich this place uh, is. Of course, they have different uh, forms, different ornamentation. Uh, what is very important, we have also a pottery which is older than, uh, than uh, 10th century. So probably the place function, uh, the place is much older than we expect in the, begin uh, in the beginning and uh, much older than information which we have in historical. Uh, sources. So you may see here some um, examples of the uh, pottery. Uh, other elements, um, artifacts related with everyday life, like spin um, spin wheels, um, owls, um, knives, um, water stones, wet stones. Sorry, um, piece of comb which are extremely, extremely small. Um, jewelry, here we have earring, um, yes, earring, temple rings, typical Slavonic um, jewelry, which was used by the ladies. They hang them on, on a belt on, uh, near, the, near the temple. That's why they use the, the name, um, which were made from the silver. Here we have another uh, example. Uh, pendants uh, and elements related with thread, silver coins and weights. And these elements were very uh, important for us because they show us how the place functioned uh, in the past. Uh, the, uh, the fact uh, discovered during the archaeological research uh, give us very important information. Well, the, all this information in historical sources about um, the area around Ovitz are from um, 1198, so from the end of the 12th century. They are mentioned in uh, Prince Grzymisław document. He gave Ioannitz a stronghold in Starogat along with the area on the left bank of the Rzyca River uh, up to the road, which is called Via Mercator. Uh, on the map, you may see a lot of red drops. There are the points which are uh, related uh, to um, Via Mercatorum Road. It was the threadway which linked Great Poland and the Baltic. So, from this uh, perspective, uh, Ovis is more or less uh, on this uh, area. And along the Wierzyca River here, we have a several strongholds, more or less every three, four kilometers. Uh, we have kind of this kind of settlement and let's say small fortification. So it's also option to go and uh, visit, uh, visit them. Uh, how we uh, interact with the people and what kind of feedback we have. I would say that we have two different views. Something like Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde, uh, from, from, from our perspective. In 2017, when we uh, also organized Open Days, there was really a few person who come and uh, 
asked uh, us a questions, wanted to be guided, even the person in the office, uh, in um, in the office, and then the ticket ticket office, they uh, told them, suggest them uh, that there is an option to go and see the, the place and participate in kind of activities. It was problematic, but in 2019. It is completely different uh, perspective because during four weeks we have more than 1,300 people who come and wanted to see the place. Uh, even get to uh, of it is not very easy because you have to organize this whole trip. You have to use mostly your car. You have the planet. You have to use the whole day. Technically speaking, there is a lot of people, especially from uh, three city, who are coming uh, and participate in our activities open days, open lectures, which were every Wednesday, and uh, in uh, Archeo family uh, workshops. Uh, students uh, were um, guiding the, um, the tourists. They have also, an, uh, they ha uh, tourists also had the possibility to participate in part of the uh, pro uh, process. Uh, mostly it was sieving and um, there was a lot of people who were absolutely surprised uh, that they had this kind of opportunity. They were not coming one day. They were coming for a few days. Um, and just to see how the situation looks like, how they can help. There's a lot of people, local people who are coming here and start asking the question and telling their stories. What was very um, uh, essential uh, for us. Um, uh, of course, organized groups like scouts, uh, group from uh, holiday uh, groups, uh, students also um, use their skills and uh, practice their skills related with telling the story, telling about uh, archaeology. Even in the beginning, they were a little bit scared, the students. At the end, I have to say that we we're absolutely fantastic because uh, they become more open and they start to telling fantastic, uh, fantastic uh, stories. Workshops, workshops. Um, we don't have this kind of facilities like uh, uh, in Upokra. So we tried to make something in small scale. We had, let's say four episodes related with um, excavations uh, with uh, Archeo family workshops. Um, because the main target group for of its are the families with children that's why we we'll focus on this uh, area. So children, the first they were guided, we explained them what we are doing as archaeologists, then they were able to um, be a part of the process. So they start with finding um, artifacts in special prepare area, and then they had to uh, document it and make uh, also some muse museum uh, documentation just to draw it, describe it. Of course, children in the age of eight years, the biggest fun, uh, the biggest, the best thing was to write their name. So they have um, different, we had um, a different, a very interesting experience with, uh, with that. Oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> We had different experience with, uh, with this uh, area and the feedback from Ovid's uh, stronghold as an institution. Uh, we asked them a few questions. Uh, if they see any increase related with the tourists during our um, excavations, uh, what people say after the uh, excavations? Um, if they observed any other um, interesting uh, relations and situations um, linked with uh, these uh, excavations. They said first, they have definitely more visitors. Uh, we were working here also with touristic organizations, the Pomeranian touristic organizations to tell more about the, the place and show people uh, the the possibility that we organize this kind of event, they're very welcome to come. Important element was working with the bloggers. Uh, we had uh, two bloggers, but on excavations there came one person. It was a um, lady which uh, have blog which is called Freitan at Morzan, and she was absolutely uh, she was very in the the topic. 
and after her um, her posts, uh, they come to us definitely more uh, people. So we see here that we have to work more with the social media, more with the uh, local touristic uh, and regional organization. And this place, what we observed after this, uh, especially the, the season 2019, that people, especially local people, they are more uh, in the local history. It's very important for them to be a part uh, of this uh, um, research and they are um, more open, they are more involved uh, in archaeology um, and it's becoming, uh, it's, it's, they're more involved not only the inhabitants but also local authority. So we have a little bit different uh, experience than uh, in uh, Upokra because uh, I know that in Borhon we have, a, a, let's say, long tradition. Uh, here we had to start with this type of activities, especially at Ovid, and it's giving very good results and showing the potential of archaeo tourism, especially people were just asking where they can find this type of uh, activities, where they can find um, similar places and if there are people who are just saying telling the, the stories about the place so I see here very strong point for uh, our project and for archaeo tourism and archaeology like archaeology at the end you have always some surprises <laughs> thank you very much yeah thank you Carolina for this fantastic presentation and uh, these are wonderful uh, pictures of of uh, a form of life which uh, we all uh, miss uh, I mean uh, happy people I mean <laughs> engaged and uh, also maybe uh, less than two meters uh, distance so uh, yeah, it it looks really and sunshine and uh, oh yeah, so um, yeah um, we have um, yeah also thank you for uh, sticking to the time schedule. Um, we have still a few minutes. Um, there on yeah, uh, there's one question to you, um, Carolina. Um, because uh, on your on the name tag of your Zoom window it says Templar, and uh, a person has ans asked why uh, is is uh, do you have this synonym of <laughs> Templar? <laughs> uh, well, it's uh, I'm working right now at my client's computer, and Bartek's second name, if you want to translate, is Templar. It's Świątkowski. That's why. <laughs> ah, okay. That's why I appeared this this information. Okay, so uh, so <laughs> Templar is uh, is her fiance's uh, second name. Uh, <laughs> yes. Good. Okay. So done. Yeah. Okay. Check. Uh, done that. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, are there any? <coughs> Sorry, <coughs> I need a break. Uh, <coughs> so, uh, are there any more questions or small comments? Then I will uh, thank you here and I will try to um, um, press the uh, the uh, um, button here. Um, um so uh yeah so uh, we're being now uh, uh yeah um before noon so um i hope it is uh, stored now um and um, um, yeah, I think it should be all right. So uh, yeah, so we are uh, on twelve ten. So uh, I hope to see you all in um, in twenty uh, minutes. 
uh, and um, I will close the uh, live stream now. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, but I will keep the uh, the um, panel room uh, open.